Okay, it's a minute after seven. Let's get started. Uh, tonight's uh, webinar will be on brain tumor clinical trials at the Cleveland Clinic, and our special guest is Dr. Mark Malkin, neuro-oncologist from the Cleveland Clinic. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and first of all, thank you, Al, for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, I've known Al for a long time, going back to my days when I was a neuro-oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York from 1985 to uh, 2004. Um, and Al was active back then uh, advocating for patients and their families uh, struggling with a brain cancer diagnosis. Um, and so shout out to Al because um, his tireless efforts uh, on your behalf um, uh, are, are certainly to be commended. Um, any advances in medicine, not just cancer, but medicine are ultimately the result of a clinical trial, an experiment in humans with a disease. Um, so it's one thing to look at brain tumor cells in a dish and their response to a drug or to a technique. It's another to take it the next step in small animals and then large animals. But ultimately, whether a drug makes it, which is to say it's effective and it's not toxic, and ultimately gets FDA approval and ultimately gets marketed or a device for that matter, depends upon how it progresses through several stages of clinical trials. Uh, there are really five stages of clinical trials. Phase zero, um, involves taking a drug and administering it even before a diagnostic operation in a patient whose MRI scan looks like a primary brain tumor, a glioblastoma, for example. And then at the time of operation, measuring how much of that drug is in the blood and measuring how much of that drug is in the tumor to understand how the body and how the tumor handle the drug, phase zero. In phase one, the drug is given in increasing doses, in an increasing number of patients, in an effort to find what is called the maximum tolerated dose. And that dose becomes the recommended phase two dose. The primary purpose of a phase one trial is to determine the maximum safe dose. Often, particularly at the lower doses, you don't really expect, you hope for, but you really don't expect to find efficacy. If you're lucky and it's a blockbuster drug, you may well find that the drug is effective at the low dose, but in a phase one trial, the main purpose is to take something which has not been tried in humans before and try to find the maximum tolerated dose. In a phase two trial, you're taking that drug and its recommended dose, and you're giving it to all comers and now, instead of maybe a dozen patients in the trial, you may have 40 or 50 patients in the trial. Everyone's getting the drug. It's what we call a single arm trial. There's no placebo arm. And you're trying to find out first what proportion of patients do respond to the drug. And you're also, since it's fairly early on in the process, getting more information about side effects. In a phase three trial, now what you're doing is you're comparing your drug, which has shown efficacy in phase two, 
and you're either adding it to standard therapy or comparing it to standard therapy. And you're looking to see um, how much more effective it is. You're still gathering safety data, but the primary purpose of a phase three trial where patients are randomized to the new versus the old is to see if you can establish a new standard of care. And finally, a phase four trial is done after the drug or the device has FDA approval, and you're now using it in hundreds or thousands of patients uh, to gather uh, more post-marketing data, looking for um, perhaps rare side effects uh, that weren't obvious before. Everything that we have accomplished in neuro-oncology, in oncology, and in medicine in general, ultimately is because a drug or a device moved through phase zero to at least phase three. And the two examples which best illustrate this process in neuro-oncology in glioblastoma are temodar, temozolomide, which got FDA approval in 2005, uh, and the Optune device uh, by Novacure, uh, which uh, got FDA approval uh, initially for recurrent uh, glioblastoma uh, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, and then uh, more recently, uh, several years ago now, um, in, uh, in newly diagnosed glioblastoma. So that's the process, and it's very carefully regulated at each institution through a protocol review monitoring committee which looks at the scientific evidence. Does it make sense to do this experiment in humans? As well as the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, which looks at the ethical issues. Even if it makes scientific sense to do this clinical trial, is it ethical to give it to patients according to the conventions of uh, the Helsinki Accord? Um, any institution has to decide which clinical trials it's going to do. And that will vary from institution to institution based upon the kinds of patients it sees. I have now been doing neuro-oncology for 35 years. And the patients and the kinds of patients and the kinds of tumors I saw at Memorial Sloan Kettering were in many respects similar, but often different than what I saw at Medical College of Wisconsin, where I was for nine years, at Virginia Commonwealth University, where I was for eight and a half years, and now at the Cleveland Clinic. Any institution can't do everything. You want the clinical trial to succeed. You want to enroll patients in an expeditious manner to get a result as quickly as possible. And so the clinical trials that any institution does are most sensibly based on what diseases that institution sees. Um, currently at the Cleveland Clinic, we have 18 open clinical trials for brain tumors. Um, and we have another eight, which are in the pipeline at the Protocol Review Monitoring Committee or the Institutional Review Board. And we have another six where we are waiting to receive protocols. Where do these protocols come from? Generally, three sources. They may be in what we call IITs, investigator-initiated trials. This situation arises when the hospital, the university, basic scientists are doing their own experiments. And when they are ready to go from the animal to the human, the study is done at that institution, an investigator-initiated trial, often supported by philanthropic funds or a grant 
from uh, a philanthropic foundation or from the National Cancer Institute. Then you have National Cancer Institute sponsored studies. These, and there are three National Cancer Institute cooperative groups. Each group has literally dozens, if not hundreds of hospitals putting patients into a clinical trial. Um, there are several large cooperative groups. There's the NRG, there is the Alliance, uh, there is the SWOG. Uh, those are probably uh, the, the big ones uh, in the US. Um, in Europe, there is the EORTC. Um, and there uh, in Canada, there's the National Cancer Institute of Canada. And so typically these cooperative groups are the ones doing the trials that demand the largest number of patients to come up with an answer, typically the phase three and some of the phase two trials. Uh, and then you have pharma sponsored trials where, a, where the scientists, the medicinal chemists, or the, or the um, biomedical engineers at a company have come up with a drug and they provide the drug or they provide the device and they sponsor the clinical trial. So most institutions doing clinical trials in brain cancer are doing a combination of investigator initiated trials National Cancer Institute sponsored trials, that's your tax money that's paying for that, um, or, or pharma sponsored. Um, I won't go into great detail uh, about the individual trials we're doing at the Cleveland Clinic, but I'll give you some examples of the things that we're doing. So for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, uh, we have, for example, an industry-sponsored study uh, using a compound called Survaxm, S-U-R-V-A-X-M. Um, this is a fact, this is an immunotherapy trial. Um, it is a vaccine which is directed uh, against a protein which is present on about 80% of glioblastoma cells uh, and is responsible for sustaining the growth of the glioblastoma. The protein is called Survivin and the vaccine is directed against that protein. This is for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma who have had basically a gross total resection where there is only microscopic disease on the post-op MRI. They get their radiation and their concurrent temidar um, either at our institution or even in their community. And then after that six weeks period, they are randomized to receive the vaccine or placebo. So it's a phase three trial and the randomization isn't one to one, it's actually three to two. Three patients on the vaccine for every two on the placebo. Um, the only side effect that we've seen so far is some itching and a bump at the um, uh, vaccine site. Uh, it's given like a flu shot into the muscle uh, in the bias, it's in the uh, deltoid up here. And uh, it's early days yet. Uh, and, and so we will see whether uh, the patients on the vaccine arm do better than those on the placebo arm. Everyone gets surgery, everyone gets radiation, everyone gets Temidar, and three out of every five patients gets a vaccine. So that's an industry-sponsored study. Wait a second, can I ask questions? Sure if can. Of course, uh, it applies to this particular trial. This is one of the popular trials. Everybody seems to love this trial. Um, do you check the tumor for surviving? Um, you did the surgery first. Do you check it to see if they're surviving? No. Only 80% No, and I it. think the reason why, Al, is that 80% of glioblastomas have it. Um, yeah, so but, that the, the yeah. assumption is that the vast majority of patients are going to have this protein. Mm -hmm. 
and you use a checkpoint inhibitor, I assume? Um, no. No? No. Checkpoint inhibitors have unfortunately not been effective alone or in combination with, uh, with glioblastoma. And that's because glioblastoma, unlike melanoma, for example, or renal cell cancer or lung cancer are not very immunogenic. Right, I uh, see. So a tumor, uh, a vaccine might make it immunogenic. Um, I'm sorry? <laughs> I thought a vaccine might help make it immunogenic, so it would help, but. Maybe, yeah. First, we have to see whether this works. Mm -hmm. Then you could consider adding in something. Right. I see there's a question in the chat uh -huh, from Steve. Thoughts on the phase three DCVAX-L trial results and trial design. I'll come back to that, Steve. Um, I won't forget. That's a big topic. Uh, I was going to ask about that, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or you know what? I can deal with that. I can deal with that. I, I can deal with it. I am very familiar with this trial. Very, very familiar with this trial. Did you put um, in it? And um, I think the trial design was poor. I think the trial design was biased. They changed the trial design in the middle of the trial when they didn't get the results they were looking for. Um, and there were protocol violations that were not reported that would affect the trial results. Um, and so we really can't say whether DCVAX is effective or not. I don't think it's toxic, but we really can't say whether DCVAX is effective or not. And I do not think in the neuro-oncology community in general, this is going to move forward. I'm not the only one who thinks this. Unfortunately. Um, so um, an example of a trial for newly diagnosed glioblastoma that is sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. So several years ago in Germany, in patients with glioblastoma, newly diagnosed, whose MGMT promoter was methylated, the glioblastoma patients with the better prognosis, the Germans demonstrated in a small study that adding lomustine chemotherapy to temidar chemotherapy provided better survival benefit than temozolomide alone. The cost was a higher, a harder hit to the blood counts, particularly the white count. The problem with the study was what we call a type one error where not enough patients were in the study to definitively statistically show benefit. And so the NRG, one of the uh, brain tumor, uh, one of the National Cancer Institute cooperative groups is repeating this study where um, hundreds of patients will be in. Everyone gets surgery, everyone gets radiation, Everyone gets Temadar during and after uh, radiation therapy, and half of them, in addition, receive the Lomustine. Um, this study is early days. Um, as of a few weeks ago, only 19 patients have been randomized, uh, but uh, we expect that, uh, uh, that, that hundreds of patients ultimately will get randomized um, and so we get a definitive answer here that um, simply stated, the question is, is more better? Uh, and if it is better, is it worth the cost of decreased blood counts? The Germans demonstrated decreased blood counts, but fortunately, the decreased blood counts and particularly the white count did not result in an increase in infections in the group who got the Temadar and the Lomustine. So this might be something 
uh, that could become a new standard of care. And then an example of a cooperative group study, which is not sponsored by pharma or the NCI is the agile study. So in the agile study, patients with glioblastoma newly diagnosed are randomized to one of four arms. Temidar is the standard arm, a drug called VAL-OH3, which is given intravenously, or a drug called troriluzol, which is given orally, or a drug called VT1021, which is given intravenously. And the agile study, which is being done in dozens of institutions across North America, is what's called an adaptive design, where very quickly patients in any of the arms are analyzed for efficacy. And if the drug is efficacious, it comes off this trial and goes on to a phase three. But if the drug is ineffective, it drops out of the trial and another one replaces it. Um, and so the point of the Agile study is to get rapid answers to, uh, to this question. In the newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients, the standard arm is Temidar. In the recurrent glioblastoma patients on Agile, the standard drug is lomustine, which is what we would use in most patients at recurrence. Um, so uh, this is a newer statistical design, the Agile study, to get answers faster. And, it, um, and as I mentioned, can be used upfront or at recurrence. At Cleveland Clinic, we have just opened up an investigator-initiated study. It has been shown when you take glioblastoma and you put it into an experimental animal and you make that animal hypothyroid you, with, with various means, there are drugs which can lower the thyroid, you improve the survival of the animal with that implanted glioblastoma. And so we have just recently, within the past couple of weeks, opened an investigator-initiated trial here where patients with recurrent glioblastoma have their tumor removed, and then they're put on the oral drug methimazole, which is used to treat patients with an overactive thyroid. The intent being to lower their thyroid function and improve their glioblastoma outcome. Um, so that's an example of an investigator-initiated trial. Um, another trial, which we're using in recurrent glioblastoma at Cleveland Clinic, uses a drug which is FDA-approved for breast cancer. Um, and what you're doing here is you are essentially repurposing a drug. There is a protein on the surface of breast cancer cells called TROP2. The same protein is on the vast majority of glioblastoma cells. And so what we're using here, and the sponsor is the University of Texas, is what's called an antibody drug conjugate, a Trojan horse, if you like. It's, the name is sasituzumab govitecan. So sasituzumab is the antibody. And the purpose of the antibody is to target that TROP2 protein. Attached to the antibody is govitecan, which is related to the chemo drug topotecan. And so when the sasituzumab binds on to the glioblastoma cell, the govitecan sneaks inside and you're giving chemotherapy just to the glioblastoma cell, not to any other cells in the brain because they don't have that TROP2 protein. This drug's, because it's an antibody drug conjugate, it's given intravenously. Um, not everything is a glioblastoma. So for example, we work with the National Cancer Institute and the Alliance Group um, looking to treat patients with meningioma. Meningioma is usually a benign brain tumor, 
But sometimes meningioma is atypical or malignant, coming back after surgery and radiation or even invading the brain. This doesn't happen often, fortunately, maybe 15% of all glioblastoma, of all meningioma, but it does happen. And what's interesting about meningioma is depending where it is in the head, up over the surface, base of the skull, the genetics of it are different. And so there is an open trial in Alliance for patients with meningioma of the base of the skull that has recurred after surgery and radiation. These tumors tend to have a mutation called AKT, and there is an oral drug called capivacertib, which targets that mutation. And we're hoping in that open label trial, phase two trial, no placebo, all patients get that drug, we're hoping that it will be effective in stopping the growth of meningioma and even shrinking it. Um, we treat patients with primary CNS lymphoma, lymphoma that starts in the brain. There is a new oral drug called tirabrutinib, which we're hoping to use uh, in, in patients with this condition. Um, and, and that is sponsored um, by, uh, by pharma. So, that kind of gives you the flavor of the variety of diseases we treat at the Cleveland Clinic, the variety of approaches we use, the phases of the trials, and who sponsors them. So that is about a half an hour, um, which leaves time for any questions you might have. Um, what percent of your GB, uh, here's a question. What percent of your GBM patients with any form of treatments at Cleveland Clinic is alive after five years? I think the answer is about 10%. Um, and that's no different than I think anyone else in the world uh, who has this experience. Um, what's my record? Um, my record is about 35 years. Um, I just heard today from a patient of mine who I treated when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering shortly after I began there. Um, he is about 35 years out. Um, he, his, uh, he was 40 when he was diagnosed. Um, he, uh, uh, his two boys uh, are now grown and married and uh, they have uh, grandchildren now. Um, and later this summer, uh, he and his wife will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. That is truly an outlier. And I don't think it had anything to do with me. <laughs> I suspect that his tumor, MGMT, was highly promoter methylated. And he responded to the, uh, to the uh, carmustine chemotherapy we gave him. A um, couple of other questions in the chat. <clears throat> Experience with oligodendroglioma, any trials? Um, so there are lots of experience with oligodendroglioma. There is a clinical trial um, which is uh, currently uh, being done uh, in the, uh, under the auspices of the National Cancer Institute uh, in the NRG and in Alliance in collaboration with the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, because oligodendroglioma is one of the more less common primary brain tumors, and so you need to have an international effort to get enough patients. Um, all patients receive radi uh, have had surgery. They all have the 1P19Q co-deletion. They all have the IDH1 mutation by definition. And they all get radiation and half of them are randomized to the traditional chemotherapy arm of PCV, procarbazine, CCNU, or lomustine and vincristin, and the other half are randomized to temozolomide. Uh, the trial is enrolling very well. I think we have less than two years now of enrollment, and then there's going to be follow-up. And it's going to take a long time to know the answer. Why? Because the average survival of a patient with an oligo who gets surgery, radiation, 
And the traditional PCV chemotherapy is 13 years. So it could take as long as 13 years or more to know if there's any difference between the PCV arm or the Temodar arm. Um, but that trial is going on. I'm also aware that Stephen Bagley at the University of Pennsylvania has a clinical trial for oligodendroglioma that has recurred after standard therapy with an oral drug. Um, question from Tom B. Are there trials for glioblastoma that are promising that allow for patients that have taken Avastin? Great question. Um, so um, the answer is yes. It used to be that having taking Avastin excluded patients with recurrent glioblastoma from clinical trials. That thinking is changing. And so you have to look at clinicaltrials.gov on a case-by-case -case basis to know which clinical trials allow previous Avastin treatment. What Avastin does in recurrent glioblastoma is it delays the time until the next recurrence, but it doesn't affect overall survival. And so there are now clinical trials uh, just in the past two to three years that allow Avastin. And you have to look on it, as I say, on a case-by-case -case basis. Why do patients- Sorry, let me stop you for one second. You can. We have a patient navigation program where our nurse navigators will find the trials that fit you, even if you had Avastin. Usually there's a washout period, but they could still get you into the trials. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Right, right. Question from Jennifer B. Why do GBM or other terminal cancer patients have to be subjected to phase three trials? We should have the same rights to access as those in need of HIV, where phase three trials were deemed cruel and drugs approved after phase two because of the ACT UP movement. Jennifer, if we have a drug or device in glioblastoma or any other cancer where a phase two trial shows uh, shows early promise, um, the first of all, the phase two trial is stopped and we apply to the FDA for what's called expedited approval. So if you have a slam dunk drug or device, then you don't necessarily have to go to phase three, particularly in a rare disease where it could take years uh, to get enough patients into a phase three trial. Phase three trials are used in the vast majority of cases where the difference between standard therapy and the new therapy is marginal. But if you have a slam dunk drug or device, then the FDA can give expedited approval just based on phase two. And this typically happens in orphan diseases. Can I add something here? Um, uh, our organization is working on such a plan. It's called the Promising Pathway Act. Uh, it's gonna be introduced into Congress this month where we get a new, FDA pathway to approval, it's conditional approval after a phase two trial, but the requirement is after the conditional approval, everybody is followed in a virtual trial as if it is a phase three trial. Uh, it just changes the approval from uh, after phase three to usually to after phase two, but then expands the amount of research because every patient using the drugs is then followed for as long as it takes up to seven years to prove that it actually does work. Right. Um, we're gonna do another webinar on that soon. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, from Tom B, does wearing the Optune device impact eligibility for clinical trials? Um, some clinical trials are, um, so, so first of all, in order to be eligible for a clinical trial, um, there are two approaches to this. If the patient is on the Optune device, and the Optune device is stopped, they can enter the clinical trial the next day. The thought being that the Optune device only works when the current is on, when the battery's turned on. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing is um, increasingly clinical trials are allowing patients in on the Optune device and the trial, the, the outcome is stratified according to whether they're wearing the device or not. So, so the patient is on the experimental drug and some of them are wearing Optune and some of them aren't. And the statistician is looking at both arms. They're not randomized. They're just allowed to use the device. And then we know ahead of time if they're using the device or not, or they intend to use the device or not. That is increasingly becoming an okay thing to do. It'll vary from trial to trial, but increasingly it's becoming an okay thing to do. That's good news. What are your thoughts on Optum? Oh, I'm a big fan. I, am I was too. involved when I was at the Medical College of Wisconsin in the a study of the Optune device in recurrent glioblastoma, and, um, and 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 we demonstrated that it was as effective as standard chemotherapy um, in that situation. Um, and uh, I wasn't a co-investigator on the uh, newly diagnosed study, but there is no question in my mind when I saw that data presented at the Society for Neuro-Oncology where Optune was added to surgery plus radiation plus Temodar, no question in my mind that it adds, uh, that it's effective. Uh, yeah, so that I, I, I'm a big fan. Mm -hmm. Let me sneak in a couple other questions from the other sources. Yeah. So let's hold on for one second. Uh, the question is, you have 18 clinical trials going on simultaneously now, right? Right. Why can't you use each of the other trials as the control group instead of each of those trials having a control group if they're phase threes? Similar because to the, uh, the eligibility trial. criteria will vary from trial to trial. And, and which, which, so it's a very important question you've asked. Um, what we do and what other institutions do is we try to fill holes in the portfolio, gaps in the portfolio. So some trials are going to um, target patients with IDH wild type. Some are going to target patients with MGMT methylated or unmethylated. Um, and so, so you have not necessarily competing trials, but you have trials where the eligibility criteria are different. So you, you couldn't use one trial which has MGMT methylated patients as a control for a trial that has MGMT unmethylated patients, right? right. You well, couldn't wait, have a wait. trial comparing yeah. IDH wild type so, to IDH mutant yeah. as a control. Couldn't you uh, put all of them into your registry and create a synthetic control group with the matched characteristics? You, yes, I suppose you could. Especially if I'm you work in conjunction a, with other I'm sensors. not enough of a statistician to know, to give you a definite answer to that. Okay, we're just trying to avoid placebos. <laughs> we don't like placebos. Oh yeah, no, and, and increase, we're, uh, understood, understood. Um, but there's nothing that we give that doesn't have side effects. And quality of life, is of enormous import of course. In, in patients, even with a malignant disease. Um, when I meet my patients for the first time, I tell them we have two goals and they are inextricably linked. It's to help you live as long as possible, as well as possible. Um, and one of the issues with smallish phase one and phase two trials is you can get side effects that you had no idea were going to happen based on animal studies, and they can be nasty. Mm -hmm. SU101, which was made by Sujin, looked fine in phase one, and it was only when we got to phase two that we saw terrible side effects, and it killed the drug. Um, so, um, uh, in, I think increasingly, uh, what you know, mo what, what most phase two trials are comparing standard versus standard plus. Right. 
Um, um, most patients going into clinical trials don't just want standard. That's why they're taking the clinical trials. Correct. Yeah, let me ask you more questions other than the ones on that list. Go ahead. A whole bunch of questions. What percentage of patients at the Cleveland Clinic enter a clinical trial versus go on either standard or whatever you decide? I've only been at the clinic for 11 months now. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, my guess is it's about 10%. And that's probably not too different than most other places. Yeah, that's in the ballpark. And how do you pick which trial? Say you have three trials that the patient's eligible for. Yeah. How do you decide which one to put them in? Right. So um, what we do is we look at um, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, if let's suppose that the tumor is in a place which is surgically accessible and we have a surgical clinical trial, then that will come to the top of the list because at the next recurrence, it may not be surgically accessible, right? right. Um, we'll look at, uh, you know, some trials, you can have any number of recurrences. So the methimazole trial, that makes the patient hypothyroid. Um, there's any number of recurrences. Patients are eligible for that trial. But some trials, they're only eligible at first or second recurrence. So that will help us decide what rises to the top. And then, as my good friend and colleague Wade Miller, at neurosurgeon at Medical College of Wisconsin, once said, the patient has a vote. So sometimes truly there is equipoise and two equally good choices. And the patient will have a feeling based upon their own research and based upon logistics, um, they'll have their own very strong opinion about what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And that's completely legit. Um, the patient has a vote. Uh, and sometimes that's what decides it. Sure, but would you ever, not you, but would a doctor ever use his experience with patients in the trial, like if they realize something is going pretty well or something's not going well, would you ever use that or would you completely blank that out of your mind? Oh, if something is going really well, then it's time to say, maybe it's time to stop this trial and and move it forward to the next phase or to the FDA. And conversely, if, if anyone sees that what this good idea, unfortunately, is associated with unexpected side effects, mm -hmm. it's time to stop that trial and not expose anyone else to it and go to something else. The problem is, Al, that when you're doing a study on a few number of patients in your own institution, you may you may be biased by your own initial experience. Sure. I mean, let me give you an analogy. The, the Toronto Maple Leafs, my home team, have now lost three games in a row to Florida. I saw. <laughs> even because the big four haven't shown up. Sure. So... Should they just tank the fourth game on Wednesday and let and let um, Florida win it and go to the third round? There's a chance that Toronto could win four games in a row. This has happened three times before True. in the NHL, True. including Toronto in 1942. So you have to be very careful to get out of a study too early because of your own small institutional experience. And that's the advantage of big numbers. I think the same thing happened with Optum. People who tried it the first time and it didn't work on that first patient, they stopped using it too quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Um, um, a couple more quick ones. Uh, go ahead. About how many glioblastoma patients a year is seen at the Cleveland Clinic? Um, 
when we what we look at uh, what are called analytical patients, so patients that we see at the Cleveland Clinic that we treat, it's about a hundred. Okay. And then there are at least twice as many that we see as second opinions that are being treated elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can so go back to this is question. why we have six, soon to be seven neuro-oncologists here, because it's a huge volume. Yes. Um, a question keeps coming up about DC Vax again. Yep. I actually like it. I know you don't like it. But the bottom line in the trial was they had a large number of people alive at five years. No matter what you think of the methodology, mm -hmm. there was a lot of people alive at five years. Um, mm -hmm. So the question here in the chat is, what about doing combinations of Optune with a vaccine, such as DC Vax? Oh, I think I think Optune with immunotherapy therapy makes a lot of sense. If you look at the survival curve of the EF14 study, the newly diagnosed glioblastoma study with Optune, there is a tail on that curve. Yes. Right? It, it, it flattens out. It flattens out. And, yeah. and what was the survival at three years? It was about 20%, right? So what you other the webinar curves... on this last night? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what other curves, you know, survival curves, Kaplan-Meier plots in, um, in oncology look like that? The immunotherapy trials look like that. Exactly. Melanoma with nivolumab and ipilimumab looks like that. Non-small cell lung cancer with Keytruda looks like that. And I've had discussions with the basic scientists of, at Novacure and the original theory, and I think it holds water, is that the Optune device at the last stage of mitosis prevents two daughter cells from moving apart. But we don't think that's the only effect. We think that there's an immune effect to the Optune device. And so you may be able to get a better bang for your buck if you used Optune with some sort of immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, actually, they had a trial going on of Optune plus a checkpoint inhibitor, and they worked good together. So the thinking was you had a vaccine too. Yeah. You need something like radiation therapy or a vaccine or laser interstitial thermal therapy or something. Something to trigger the immune response. It's going to trigger um, antigen production in the tumor microenvironment that a vaccine or Optune or immune checkpoint inhibitor can take advantage of. Just treating a bland glioblastoma with immune checkpoint isn't going to get it done. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's take some more from this list. Right. Any thoughts on hydrogel treatment in mice? I don't. I don't know because I'm not familiar with it, Lita. There's a recent study about that. That's what they're referring yeah. to. Yeah. How long does it take to get from mice to human trials? Years. Yeah. Years. Okay. Um, any trials for newly diagnosed? Um, astrocytomas, IDH mutant. Um, so let me have a look at my list of things which are in the pipeline here. Um, and yes, there is a clinical trial sponsored by ANHART, that's capital A, small n, capital H, E-A-R-T, ANHART Therapeutics, uh, where we are going to go in collaboration with Duke University using their IDH inhibitor, which is called AB-218 in grade three IDH mutated gliomas. Um, the um, it's been approved by our scientific committee and by the committee at Duke. Um, I expect that this will be live here and at Duke this summer. 
Um, Jennifer B says Sturvax M should be in that slam dunk arena. Well, the results out of the phase two study of Cervax M were promising. I wouldn't say slam dunk, um, but, but promising. What do you think about the potential, also from Jennifer B, the potential for oncolytic viral therapy? Oh, I think this has good potential. Um, and um, there's a, um, a, a mosaic virus, uh, a mosaic adenovirus has been created by Paul Fisher uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University Massey Cancer Center. Um, and um, it delivers uh, the gene uh, for interleukin-24, which is an immunotherapy uh, into the glioblastoma. Uh, this has been used successfully in animals. It has been used safely in animals. And uh, a clinical trial is planned with Virginia Commonwealth University, Cleveland Clinic, MD Anderson, Northwestern and Hopkins using this uh, uh, viral directed gene therapy. Um, the initial plan is to do it in recurrent glioblastoma using a technique called convection enhanced delivery, where the tumor is removed surgically, a catheter is placed into the cavity and hooked up to a pump. And over about 20 hours, the virus is slowly infused into the cavity. Um, and the virus uh, targets the glioblastoma cells and then spreads to other glioblastoma cells, but doesn't infect normal brain cells. And if this works, the next trial will be to use this oncolytic virus uh, given intravenously with focused ultrasound. And the focused ultrasound opens the blood-brain barrier, allowing the virus to get into the brain tumor. So this, this still has potential, no question. Uh, what am, and, and, this, and, this, uh, the, and, and so that segues nicely into Diana's uh, question. What are, what are our thoughts about the effectiveness of sonodynamic therapy or focused ultrasound? So we do have a focused ultrasound protocol in recurrent glioblastoma uh, going on here at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, it's called Sonalysense. Um, and so um, uh, the ALA is uh, alpha um, amino levulinic acid, um, and which targets tumor cells. And so using focused ultrasound, we drive the ALA through the blood-brain barrier into the tumor to directly kill the tumor. This is, we probably have two or three patients on the clinical trial now, a phase two, a phase two trial in recurrent glioblastoma. No, and, and um, there's a study going on at Sunnybrook Medical Center in Canada, in Toronto, using focused ultrasound in recurrent glioblastoma uh, with adriamycin, doxorubicin which typically doesn't work if you just give it intravenously. But that may be because intravenously, we've never been able to get enough drug into the tumor and focused ultrasound or sonodynamic therapy may be a way to get past the blood-brain barrier. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about that new approach. Okay, a couple more here. Uh, what are your thoughts on LIT, L-I-T-T? -T? Um, also, I'm a fan. Um, so LIT, laser interstitial thermal therapy, is a technique where uh, with a biopsy, one can first determine in the operating room, take a time out, are we dealing with tumor or are we dealing with radiation necrosis in a tumor that's already been radiated? And then regardless if it's tumor or radiation necrosis, then through the same path, a laser probe is inserted. The end of the probe can rotate around 360 degrees and heat is applied to emulsify the tissue 
just in that area. Um, uh, it has been demonstrated to be effective in treating radiation necrosis, in treating recurrent glioblastoma. There are certain size parameters. The thing has to be in a certain location and it, and it can't be much more than about three centimeters in diameter. Um, you have to stay away from eloquent parts of the brain, like speech area. You have to stay away from the ventricle of the brain where the spinal fluid's made. But there are cases where this is appropriate and effective. Um, Dr. Ali Mohammadi at our place has now treated more than 400 patients with this technique. So it has a place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to mention my brother in law had a brain tumor operation at the Cleveland Clinic recently, a pituitary tumor, um, uh -huh. which luckily benign, of course. Yes. Uh, but we sent him there from New York. Very um, good. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last question in the room here is cryofreeze. Cryofreeze, not something I'm familiar with, Jennifer. Um, I, 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 I attend our spine tumor board, and um, cryotherapy or radiofrequency ablation is sometimes used for patients with tumor in a vertebral body uh, in the spine for metastasis. Uh, but I'm not aware that it is applicable to a brain tumor. Okay, that concludes our webinar for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. That was very informative. Next week on Monday, May 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we have uh, Pediatric Brain Tumors, The Duke Experience with Dr. Daniel Landy. So we'll see you guys next week. And thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, Al. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.